Joining me now to break it all down is Yale Climate Connections meteorologist and former hurricane hunter, Dr. Jeff Masters. Uh, Dr. Masters, you, you've been an expert in this field for a long time. It's a long time uh, reader of your blog. I'm very curious to get your thoughts on this. And the obvious question is how does this happen? 115 miles per hour of intensification in just 24 hours time. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. And it's pretty crazy that it hit Acapulco, a place that hasn't seen a hurricane impact for decades, maybe back in the 1970s or the last one. So a number of factors contributed. I mean, the obvious one is sea surface temperatures. Mexico had its hottest September on record, and the waters offshore there were heated up to very high levels to great depths. So that's one factor. Also, we have the upper level winds. There was a very strong jet stream present just to the north of the hurricane, and there was a maximum of wind speed in that jet called a jet streak that was pulling air out of the top of the hurricane and ventilating the storm. It's kind of like when you ventilate a fire and you give it more oxygen. Well, this upper level wind max was doing the same thing to the hurricane. It was allowing more warm, moist air to come into the hurricane and be shunted aloft, and so it could intensify even more, pulling in even more warm, moist air at the surface. So the upper-level winds, the warm sea surface temperatures, and the fact this was a relatively small hurricane aided it. Small hurricanes are more easily able to change intensity either upward or downward because there's less energy needed to do that. So after this event now, there will be a, a lot of research done on this, of course. But the next question is, as we understand some of the processes that occurred to allow this type of extreme rapid intensification, why wasn't it sampled in the forecast models or, or at least kind of indicated in that direction? 24 hours out, we didn't even have a hurricane warning issued, but there really wasn't much to indicate that this potential was even there. I think it might have been a different case if this was an Atlantic storm, because we had only one hurricane hunter flight into Otis. Uh, Mexican hurricanes in the Pacific just don't get as much coverage. If it had been in the Atlantic, we would have sent the NOAA hurricane hunters in, which have tail Doppler radars on board, which provide an extra boost of data to feed into these models to help make better forecasts. Without that extra good data, we were just kind of stuck with using satellite measurements to understand what Otis was doing. And furthermore, we didn't have ground-based radar either. When a storm is near land in the Atlantic, we've got our very good system of Doppler radars along the U.S. coast that provide data to our models. Mexico didn't have a radar for us. So lack of data was a big reason why the models didn't do better than they did. Yeah, I think, I think that's an, an excellent point. These forecast models are only as good as the data that's ingested into them, and it wasn't very good, clearly, this go around. A Yale Climate Connections meteorologist and, and former hurricane hunter, Dr. Jeff Masters, uh, thanks for talking with us here on Fox Weather. Great to get your insight. I'm Amy Freeze. Welcome to Fox Weather's YouTube page. We have more great videos on the way, so make sure to subscribe to stay updated on all things weather.